This is Amy Park, and this is another episode of Backtable OBGYN. I am so pleased, so honored to have today as our guests, Steve McCarris. Steve is a board-certified and internationally recognized OBGYN. I also have on our podcast, Paula Bilica, who is a San Antonio OBGYN with Legacy Women's Health. This podcast is supported by Pacera Biosciences Incorporated. However, Pacera had no control or direction over the final content presented. In terms of your playbook, because I feel like that might be the roadblock is the administration portion. Because it's, I mean, I think most physicians want, we want our patients to not have a lot of pain. What was, what were the compelling arguments to cover the cost? Because as of right now, 2024, it's not covered, but was it just the the patient, the redu- reduction in opioids? That's one. And, you know, you, you present them the data and you present them the studies. And then the other thing that, as we all know, hospitals are very, very interested in and very serious about are their, you know, patient satisfaction scores, right? So when our g oncologist, you know, presented hey, look, these patients, you know, they're very happy. They're, they want to come back to this hospital for their next surgery and come back to us for the next C-section. And, you know, of course, that got their attention, you know, because that's very important to them. The Prescani scores, right? That's what they're called. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, I think women's health gets the short end of the stick a lot because Expert was used already in colon rectal at my hospital and general surgery at my hospital. And they were pushing back on the OBGYNs to use it. And it really took a champion, somebody to speak up to pharmacy, because it comes out of the pharmacy's budget. And pharmacy, you know, is all, all they care about is their budget. And we went to administration. We said, listen, women receive, I think it was 65% of all opioid prescriptions in this country. Because think about think about women's exposure to surgery early in reproductive years. Somebody has a, you know, an ovarian cyst or a miscarriage or an ectopic or whatever. They have surgery in their twenties, and and forty percent of women are more likely to be persistent opioid users because of surgery. Right, and surgery is painful, and you've got to cover that. So we really looked at women's health and looked at. Issues around surgery, one in, I think it's one in every 15 people you operate on become chronic opioid users. There's 115 deaths every year in this country from opioid overdose. It's a gateway to other drugs. So there was all these issues around women's health. And women's health is important to the hospital because we all know women drive healthcare to what hospital you go to. You know, you know what I mean? I mean, if the mom says, oh, my son's sick, take her to that hospital. I had a, you know what I mean? I had a great experience there. But the exposure in women's health to opioids is, is pretty high. And people, we were giving opioids. And then if you think about it, how many opioids do you really need after a hysterectomy? I mean, 10, 15, or whatever it is, maybe some patients don't use them at all, and then they just have all this opioids hanging around the house. So when you talk to the pharmacy, he doesn't care about all that. He just cares about his budget. So we went to the nursing staff. We went to the administrators. We, you know, at our OBGYN departmental meetings, we have to, we have to present the No Pain Act. They don't really understand it or, or know that it's happening. So I think The real answer is having someone at the hospital who's a champion for women's health, somebody who's going to look at the data, speak up. We're not going to overuse it, misuse it. We're going to use it. Like, I don't use it if I do a laparoscopic oophorect. I don't use it. I don't use Expiril. But if you do, you do a three port stage four endo case, you do a four port sacral colpopexy where there's a lot of twerking on the abdominal wall. There's a lot of surgical you know, in uh, work that you're doing, I think it's indicated, right? The the profile, there, there's never been a death that, that I know of from uh, uh, expiral toxicity. If you look at the on-cue pump and the delivery of uh, an analgesic in that 
arena on cues, another way to deliver an analgesic interabdominally. The plasma concentrations of the pivocaine are much higher than expiral. Expiral peaks and comes down at 72 to 96 hours. You have to get, I think it's 2,000 picograms per mil of expiral to see cardiac or central nervous system toxicity. So the profile is really low on side effects. So you have a drug that's effective. It has a, a low toxicity uh, score. It decreases opioid exposure in women's health, which is what we all really care about. And yes, it's, a, yes, it's much more expensive than bifidocaine hydrochloride. But if you prevent one side effect of opioid and exposure, a dependency, a nausea, lightheadedness, rectal impaction because of narcotics and low mobility and, you know, all the things that happen. So you can justify it. And it really kind of makes sense that it is an effective analgesic that's going to increase your patient's experience at the hospital, decrease their exposure to opioids. The cost is worth it. We have to justify, you know, risk benefit of everything. So I think that's what where that's how we approached it anyway. Yeah, we were kind of the same way. We had a committee that got together, and you know, it was headed by the GUN oncologist. But you know, you also have decrease in hospital stay usually if you, if you have you know less pain, less readmission rate, lower readmission rate, which is good for the hospital. And yeah, the toxicity, as long as it's used appropriately and it's, you know, somebody who knows how to use it and how to admix it and they don't admix it, you know, that with lidocaine or, you know, there, there are some some rules about that. Then it's, you know, it's, it's yeah, the, I've never heard of anybody, you know, how many kind of, I, I've never had it, toxicity from Expro on any patient. I don't know any colleagues that have. So, so it's, it's very safe. And then the other, the other thing that just comes to mind is educating the nurses on the floor. And having them know that this patient got extra. And nurses in recovery. Because if there is a, a patient who's not responding appropriate to, to voice commands or she has CNS changes or cardiac changes, you know, you, you want to know that patient got extra because anything could happen, right? Uh, and then on the floor, if you're admitting the patient, the nurses need to know this patient got extra. We're going to decrease narcotic use. Matter of fact, just give her Ofermed or Motrin or maybe Tramadol, something like that. So it really is a team approach in trying to optimize this patient experience and reduction to opioids. And it seems to work. I mean, we, we transitioned from GYN to only using it now to the OBs, using it for C-sections. Everybody's kind of on board and we're not hearing any really backlash on calls and that sort of thing. I was just going to kind of piggyback on that with um, with the nurses, and, and it's a whole, it, it's a team effort, right? So, and with all the hospitals, most hospitals now have ERAS protocols, and getting the expert to be part of that ERAS protocol. So, like Dr. McCara said afterwards, you know, most of my patients will just either get some Toradol or some, you know, Tylenol. Um, with on top of their Expirel uh, because they've already, you know, anesthesia is taken care of them during surgery. And then uh, preoperatively, they've gotten their their ERAS medications. And so it is a team effort. And as, as long as everybody's part of that, um, it really works well. That was something that I was curious about in terms of ERAS, because I was talking to our MFMs here a uh, couple, this was now maybe two years ago, but they did not use ERAS on the labor suite. But it seems to make sense that there would be a role for, you know, these for like blocks. C-sections or yeah, yeah, at C-sections at the time yeah. of C-sections. Are you guys using ERAS for C-sections? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. ACOC put out a huge statement on that. You know, opioid exposure to the post obstetrical patient that really recommended non-opioid intraoperative use and post-operative use of but they actually called out, I think, Expril for a tap blocker soft tissue infiltration. That's probably been three years ago. So ACOG really looked at trying to reduce I mean, you know, we all the opioid exposure in this country that we've heard about for the past what, six years now. Uh ACOG did put out a position statement on it. It really recommended it. Yeah, I, I don't know since I'm not really, you know, really <laughs> dialed into the labor suite at this point. So they might have they might have it or might not. But um, but uh, I just think that it's such an opportunity 
it's a big incision and there's a lot of manipulation going on there. And it sounds like you guys are believers. I mean, I think for the, that's a, that is a challenge for women's health though, because you're right. Colorectal and gynonc, these big incisions, but banine, OBGYN surgery has the uptake and the attention to this issue has been for sure decreased compared to and less attention compared to other fields. So this is where we learn from our colleagues and the interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary knowledge that gets shared. I mean, you know, a woman ha has a colectomy or something else, hemorrhoidectomy, they get expro and then women's health, we can't offer it. That's not right. Right. I mean, you know, C-section is a major surgery, even though you're awake and you're, you know, hap it's a happy occasion and everything, you know, it is still abdominal surgery. And so I think that's kind of why it was overlooked. Maybe women, you know, it's it, they think, oh, she's having a baby. It's I don't know. You know, a lot of people don't think of it as major surgery. And it is. And I tell my patients, you're having major surgery. This is this is a big surgery. You're having an abdominal incision. We have to go through all the layers just like we go, through, you know, go, do any of our surgeries. And so they have pain just like anybody else, you know, if if not more. I mean, C-sections are not a, a gentle surgery, you know, uh, and I and I tell my patients that, you know, so I think even more so for them, it's important uh, to have this pain relief. And, you know, one thing that comes to mind just because we're talking about this, Expro is contraindicated for a paracervical block. I don't think anybody would ever use it for that, but, you know, you might say, well, why don't I you know, why don't I knock out some of these labor pains or whatever, but it is contraindicated. It, it can only be used in obstetrics once, you know, the baby's delivered. Right. Yeah. They'll do the tab block after we deliver the baby. After we're, after we're done, then they'll, they'll come in, you know, the anesthesiologist will come in and do the tab block. And most of my anesthesiologists at our hospital are very receptive to it. Um, we've had a few that we had to kind of get on board, but once they, we tell them the outcomes of the patient, because a lot of times the anesthesiologists don't see the outcomes, you know, they just do the out tap lock and then they don't ever hear anything again. So when they heard what the outcomes were and how well these patients did, they were like, okay, yeah, we got it, you know. That's awesome. Well, uh, I have learned so much from all your tips and tricks. And this is really the way to learn is from the experts and also just not just the data, but hearing your anecdotal experience is always compelling, you know? So I really thank you guys for coming on, on the show and, and sharing your tips and tricks and also just how to get it on board because a lot of people don't know how to get it. So getting a champion, getting your colleagues who can attest to its efficacy, talking to the uh, pharmacy committee about it. Typically at hospitals, if you want to liaison with the, the pharmacy committee, what is the best method is going through your chair or your practice director or how did you guys know who to contact mine was a little different because i was in the operating room and i wanted to use expiral on a total abdominal hysterectomy patient and my gwan coordinator circulator said the pharmacy said you can't use it which really kind of ticked me off because i'm like hey Who's he to say I can't use this medication? And then I then picked up the phone after the case and actually called him and asked for a meeting with him uh, and went and talked to him. And it was all about his budget. So I just went right to pharmacy. But I think that was a little bold and maybe it doesn't need to be the way to do it. But I think what you can do at your OBGYN departmental meeting I think a couple of things, it's, I, what I'm planning to do at our next OBGYN departmental meeting is bring up the topic of the No Pain Act so people just know about that because it's right around the corner where that will be applicable for our patients. But I would go to that OBGYN departmental meeting and say, hey, we need to talk about Expiril. There's good data on that now and do it that way. And then the OBGYN department chair would then be able to talk to the pharmacy and the leadership team to get something together. Maybe bring the pharmacy director to your next OBGYN departmental meeting and have a discussion around Expiril. That's probably the way to do it. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to follow the podcast, rate it five stars and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore backtable OBGYN on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. 
Backtable OBGYN is hosted by myself, Mark Hoffman. And Amy Park. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhirter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz, with support from Taylor's version Hess and Yvonne Ogrodzinski. Show notes and social media by Jody Lenora. Administrative support provided by Jim Lee Kennebrew. Music written and performed by Scott Baby Daddy Hoffman. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again next time. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts and guests on Backtable OBGYN are their own and do not reflect the views or positions of their employers or any entities they represent.